Muted. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Future Cities Power of Public Spaces webinar. My name is Maggie Dressel. I'm the program manager for the Future City competition. I'm so glad you guys could join us this afternoon for the webinar. Um, before I get too much um, into the details of the webinar, can I just see a show of hands if you can hear me? Um, I always like to know that you guys can hear me. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Harrison. Awesome. Um, well, like I said, I'm so glad you guys could join us uh, for this uh, webinar. You're going to hear a lot of really great information today from our pretty fantastic subject experts here with us. Um, and we really hope that it will help you start brainstorming what types of public spaces your team's future city um, might have. Before we jump into the webinar, I wanted to share some information with you that might be especially helpful, helpful for the educators and mentors in our audience today. Future City is one of many um, programs that a nonprofit called Discovery E runs. Um, Discovery is dedicated to everything engineering. Um, I highly suggest you check out Discovery's website, which you see up on the screen right now. It's discoverye.org. Um, there's a huge number of free resources available for you to download that you can use in your classroom or after school program, even after Future City is over. Um, I also wanted to give you a quick heads up about two other um, Discovery programs and activities that um, might be on your radar these next coming months. Uh, the first is Girl Day 2017. Um, Girl Day is a program dedicated to engaging girls in engineering. We are asking people to sign up to be role models. So if you're interested, you can sign up at discovere.org slash Girl Day, and you'll start to receive emails with resources, advice, and ideas for how to engage girls in engineering. The other activity coming up is um, called Dream Big. It's an IMAX film uh, that showcases how engineers push the limits of ingenuity and innovation in unexpected, imaginative, and amazing ways. Um, it's premiering at a number of museums across the country during Engineers Week 2017. So definitely mark your calendars for February. Um, as you can see, there are also some uh, activities and lesson plans that relate to the film itself. And so we are uh, super pumped about this IMAX film all about engineering. Um, before we get started with the webinar, I just wanted to give a shout out to our amazing Future City sponsors and funders who you can see on the screen right now. We would not be able to offer you this really fun program um, without their support. So we think they're pretty fantastic and are really grateful for um, their involvement with our city. Uh, with our program and uh, really thank them for their support um, of Future City. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping and then I promise we'll get to our experts really soon. Um, so the webinar is using voice over internet and I hope you guys can hear pretty well. Um, but if the sound quality is not good, you can call in using your telephone. Um, you can see the phone number there and the code. So you might want to take a moment to write that down. Um, the recorded webinar and the slides will be posted on our website, futurecity.org slash resources, um, by the end of this week. Um, and educators, I really hope that you guys are regularly visiting uh, that section, the resources part of our website, because that's where you can download a number of um, you know, really helpful activities and um, kind of how-tos, and it's a really great source for kind of anything you could need related to the Future City program. Um, we'll also have a short uh, kind of five question survey after this webinar. Um, please take a moment to respond just to help us kind of figure out, um, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what we can improve, and how we can best um, make these webinars for you guys. Um, also, I know you guys will have a lot of questions throughout. Um, you can type these questions into the little question space on your control panel of the webinar. Um, some of the questions, if they're related to just kind of general future city, my colleague will be answering those throughout the webinar. But anything related to kind of the public space theme, we'll be having um, a Q&A session at the end with our subject experts. So we'll be holding on to your questions, don't worry, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, we have a great um, set of panelists for you today. You can see them listed on your screen right now. We have Martin Flans, Needy Gulati, Sam Goder, and Dr. Mark Boyd. And I just wanted to thank them for taking time out of their day to join us 
um, and speak about their areas of expertise and kind of share their knowledge with you. So I'm going to introduce Martin Flans right now. He works at Bentley Systems, and he is Bentley is one of our um, fantastic, uh, really important funders. Um, Martin is our host today and our master of ceremonies. He's a professional engineer, and he's worked at Bentley for more than 10 years. During his time at Bentley, he has served as a software trainer, an application engineer, a marketing manager, a user experience research manager, and he's currently the user adoption manager of Bentley's hydraulics and hydrology modeling software. Um, that sounds pretty interesting, Martin. Prior to joining Bentley Systems, Martin worked in the industry as an environmental engineer and managed the design and construction of a number of water and wastewater projects. Basically, his job had to do with anything you drink or flush. Martin is also a longtime friend and supporter of Future City. He's been uh, a team mentor and a judge on both the regional and finals level. Um, we're a huge fan of Martin, and thanks for joining us today. Let me. Uh, Martin, are you there? I am. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get going, I wanted to remind all of the students out there participating in the competition, please, please take a moment to thank your teachers and your mentors. They are contributing a lot of their time for you, so please don't forget to thank them. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get going here. Um, before the, you get to hear from the panelists, I want to remind you, uh, as you're going through the Future City competition, I just want to remind you to think, how does your model, how does your ideas become the final end product that you want to have uh, in February? Or how does a real city uh, become real? How does it actually happen? And so as you're going through your project throughout the next few months, I want you to keep in mind the engineering process. Maggie, next slide. So just remember to ask yourself as you're going through what is the problem you're trying to solve, what is the issue that's in front of you, and then what are your options? Uh, what tools do you have available? What are your requirements? What are your specifications? What are your dimensions? And, and engineers will ask themselves this. You will ask yourselves these questions during the competition. And then how do you make it work? Then you start brainstorming and following through how do you make each of these pieces of your design work. And then you have to really narrow down and test, does it work? In the real world, in the engineering world, it takes a lot more time in your world. Uh, you get to enjoy the part of uh, determining if it's going to work or not. Uh, so uh, once you get all of that done during the competition, you make it happen. You start building the model. You start uh, writing the essay uh, and the uh, presenting the presentation. So. Um, as you're doing all of this on your future city handbook on page 12, it will go through step by step the engineering process. So if you encounter a problem during the competition or an issue you don't know what to do, just rely on that uh, page 12 and it'll help you out. Uh, okay, all right, now on to our panelists. Um, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our first panelist, Nidhi Galati. She is the program manager for the Emerald Network an initiative of Livable Streets Alliance of Boston, Massachusetts. There, the Emerald Network is a vision for 200 miles of seamless greenways across the metro Boston area, helping to create safe and convenient urban recreation and transportation systems. Born in India, and soon she became involved in local advocacy organizations where she made contributions to help solve urban developmental safety and equity challenges surrounding her. She received a bachelor's degree in architecture at MNIT in Jaipur, India, and went on to earn a master's in park and community planning from Texas A&M University in College Station. Today, she now provides management, technical assistance, and advocacy support for greenways and supports livable street staff to continually advance the vision for a walkable, bikeable, and livable Austin. Nitty? Uh, it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to you as our first panelist. Thank you, Martin. So it's nice, it's really nice to be here. And I thank Future City for um, having me here. So I'll, I'll just be going through relatively quickly a bunch of 
slides that are more image heavy and the reason behind that is you can interpret it the way you want to after you're done listening to me. So before I start using the word public realm a lot, I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean for me. Uh, public realm is anything that is outside of your four walls. A lot of it is directly public space. And even if it's not public space, it directly affects how your public space acts. So even if it's your front yard, it has a direct impact on how the public space and public realm feels in any city. Next slide, please. And it's important because oftentimes when you go to a new city, a new town, or a new neighborhood, public space is what you really remember. If, you, know, you don't really remember how beautiful somebody's apartment was when you visit them, but you do remember what the street right, right outside looked or what you know, the most famous park was and how it felt and how it looked. So it's important to think about public space in order to create an impression for a city. Next, please. And to capture a visitor when you visit a place for the very first time and to promote somebody to return to your city and to improve the quality of life of the people that already live in a city, you need to create something called a sense of place or in simpler term or to make an impression. So the way your public space looks and feels helps create an impression in the minds of the people who visit there and for the minds of the people who actually live in that space. Next, please. And the public space, let's not forget, it defines how healthy you can be in your city. There's only 24 hours in your day, and jobs are getting tougher. Plus, a lot more people are starting to you know, pursue what they love and to turn, you know, turn their love for any particular topic or any particular subject into a full-time career, which also means even longer hours, because you're now, you know, you're not just doing a job, it's a lifestyle for you. So in such circumstances, it's important that your city and your neighborhood facilitates a healthy behavior, you know. It creates opportunities along the way. So if you're going to school or if you're going to work, the way your city is shaped really shapes your behavior, whether you're going to walk to work, whether you're going to ride your bicycle, or whether you're going to take public transit. All those things are dependent upon how your city is created and what opportunities are sort of on your way. Next, please. And we all know that our health is directly correlated to our happiness. The quality of the public realm has an enormous effect on your happiness. And we're all aware that of terms like you know, road rage or gathering spaces. And these terms have a lot to do with the design and character of the public realm. Next, please. And public space is also where there are places and opportunities for people to gather with minimal formality or prep work on one person's part. And if you see what you see in the image right now, a lot of these experiences and a lot of these images just happen to be public spaces. You know, that is where people gather, that is where people come together as a city, as a neighborhood, as a town, whatever scale you're working with, public spaces where people come together and have you know, social encounters with people they do or do not know. I've included this book right up there, and it's a really great read. Um, if you ever in your life have some time to read another book, please do go ahead and read A Great Good Place, which basically talks about a third place in our lives, which is public and is very social. The first and second places obviously being your home and your place of employment or your, you know, where you go to school, a place of education. So please go ahead and read that book when you get around to it. Next, please. And public space is where you do things together. And this sort of builds on to the last slide that we talked about. And if you don't have room in your public space, then you don't have room to do things like this, period. So it is important about you know, places for people to gather and come together. Next, please. A lot of these things that I've just explained also can be summarized under this, this term called placemaking. And placemaking is a lot of things. It's a frame of mind, it's a school of thought, it's a way of life, and it can also be a profession. And Sam's going to talk more about it, I'm sure. And I, I do this every day. So it is a people-centric, community-centric approach to designing your city, to planning your city. And it means stepping back and thinking about a larger vision for your environment and then zooming in to like the smallest of details, and it can all be summarized under the term placemaking. Next, please. 
And let's face it, the city becomes what it is planned to be. And the city displays the priorities that the city officials and planning officials and designers set aside. So if you plan your city for cars and traffic, you're going to get cars and traffic. And if you plan your city for people and places, then that's what you're going to get. So this is a decision that you make very early on. What is the city going to be? What is the neighborhood going to be? And who are you going to focus on? Because those decisions will end up getting reflected in every phase of your thought process. Next, please. And all these different choices that you make, like if you're designing your city for kids playing outside on the street, or if you're designing your city for people having coffee in their front porch, whatever, whatever these decisions are, they will give a very different look to the way your environment is shaped up. So these different choices do lead to different outcomes and vastly different so. And this image kind of shows you that, that if 50 people are commuting in cars versus 50 people commuting in a bus versus 50 people commuting on bicycles, what it looks like on the ground is very different. Next, please. And it is important to step back and look at the larger picture. Urban planning is a lot of times thought of as something you do on the larger scale. You know, there's a blank canvas and you start plotting either buildings or parks and you know all the big decisions, which are important. The big decisions are important, but it's also important to then step back and look at the human scale. What is my city going to feel like at the scale of you know me walking next to a storefront? So it's important to think about the big picture, but never lose sight that cities and neighborhoods and even your neighborhood where you live, it works or doesn't work at the smallest of scales. Next, please. There's a lot of books that have been written about things like this. They're, these are just some. And thanks to places like Amazon.com, once you search for one book, it gives you 50 different options. So I've included this in here, and you can refer back to it um, later on. But these are simple publications that talk about what makes a happy city? What is the public realm? How do you design the public realm? And all the different ranges of topics. The geography of nowhere on the top right there is one of my favorites because not only does it talk about where the city is today, it gives you um, a, a little lesson in history of where cities used to be and how did we get here. Next, please. And if you don't feel like reading a book, you can always just look. If you go sit outside on a bench in on a nice street or a nice park and just observe what people are doing, there are a lot of lessons to be learned there. There's a positive, very positive kind of people watching that you can do. And this person in the picture right here, Holly White or William White, did exactly that. And he was very popular in New York City. In fact, Project for Public Spaces was founded by a prodigy of William Holly White, Fred Kent. So his entire technique was to observe what people are doing and extracting public space lessons from those observations. Next, please. And plans are important. You know, that's where we work. If you're a planner or an urban designer in the future, or if you talk to an urban designer or planner today, you have to think on a large scale. It's not always possible to zoom in to the front yard level and think about how a city is going to function. So this is how you think about a city on a large scale. You know, we need houses. We need a big park. We need a shopping center. We need a school. And all those things, those are the decisions that you make on a larger scale. Next, please. And then you zoom in. And then you figure out, OK, if there's a big park, what are the activities that are going to be around it? How are people going to get there? Are they going to walk? OK, then we need sidewalks. Are people going to drive? OK, then we need a place for them to park. So it's important to, after you've done the big scale decisions, then you come inside, zoom in a little bit, and think about what is it going to look like right on the ground? If I'm standing in that space, what are the things that I need to enjoy the space? Next, please. And then one of the biggest things that you can do if you're thinking about you know, designing something right now, it's important to have some control. What are the things that you're going to control? And then leaving room for, for flexibility. You know, just changing some things around here and there, and leaving room for people to take charge and people to be able to you know, design their own city and make it what, what it can be. Next, please. And the, the funny thing is that we talk about public space and public space improvements and all these things. 
But a lot of these outcomes, you cannot really measure them. You feel them much more. If a city works at the public space level, it's more qualitative than its quantities. Numbers are important, but always know that if you've designed a great public space and a city around public spaces, it is going to be felt more than it's going to be measured. Next, please. And it can be. It's very, very common for public spaces to be an afterthought. You know, you thought a lot about the major buildings or the signature things that you are going to have, and then you go back and you're like, oh, I forgot about creating public spaces. And then you go in and you create public spaces. What happens in those cases is that there wasn't really a dialogue between when you were thinking about the building and when you were thinking about the public space. So, and what that does is create spaces like spaces like what you see right now. You know, there was for a stamp purposes there was a park, but then there was not enough consideration paid to how our vehicle is going to get around there. So now you see that somebody has started driving on that grass and that grass is not there anymore. So there's an afterthought. All these decisions about where the building goes, where the park goes, where the parking goes, they have to sort of happen at the same time. There is there is a balance right there. Next, please. And this is a picture from Boston. Um, up until four months ago, I was actually living in New York City, and now I'm in Boston. And this is a great example. This is the City Hall in Boston. It's a very famous and infamous at the same time. It's a great building. But what happened is that there was a great, large public space carved around it without really carving out everything that needs to happen to make this a great plaza. So the buildings that are around that space do not really you know, create any value for this public space. They don't really have, you know, in, in a kind of cheesy way to say this, they don't really have a conversation with the street outside. The, street, the building doesn't talk to the street. So what happens is that there is no reason for you to be in that vast, vast public space because there's no coffee shop, there's no restaurant, there's no, there's no shade, there's no bench. All those things are kind of missing. It looks good on paper and it looks good when you're in a helicopter, but down in that space, it's incredibly empty and that was, you know, that, that's when public space site sort of becomes an afterthought. Next, please. And I said this early on, and I can't emphasize it enough, that cities succeed or fail at the human scale. In your lifetime, there will probably be two times when you'll be way up there in a helicopter looking down on a space and looking down on what you created. More, more often than not, you'll be walking through those spaces. So it's really at the human scale where a city works or fails. Next, please. And Project for Public Spaces has summarized a lot of this in the, into this great diagram. I'm not going to go in great detail of what this means, but this is a recipe for what creates a great public space, what creates a great public realm. And two of the things that I think are very important here that I want to point out is comfort and image. We, as, you know, as human beings, we leave a situation or a place or a conversation that is uncomfortable to us. So what you're really trying to create with designing anything, not just public space, is to create comfort so that people would want to stay, people would want to use it. So comfort is very important. And the funny thing is that comfort is also very different for everyone. You know, what makes one person comfortable or one age group comfortable is very different from what makes a different age group comfortable. This is why it's important to think about who are you designing this space for and what is it that makes them comfortable. That's the first thing. The second thing I would like to emphasize is access and linkage. If you create anything, how are people going to get there? And if you're, for women especially, it's also important how are you going to leave that place? What is your escape strategy if you're uncomfortable and you needed to leave? How would you exit that place? So that's also very important. Next, please. And you, nobody can do it alone. Cities and neighborhoods and towns are created by a whole lot of people. It literally takes a village. So no matter what capacity you work in tomorrow when you are, you know, when you're city designers and fantastic planners, there's nothing that any group or any one profession does alone. You need stakeholders and you need partners, especially you need communities. So people who are actually going to be using these spaces need to be consulted, need to be brought on so that they feel like they are attached to it and they have a role to play. So nobody can do it alone. There are a lot of conversations. There are a lot of coalitions. Next, please. 
and then you get started on a vision of what could be. You know, if you don't have something, if you're starting with sort of a blank slate, which City Hall in Boston, it kind of looks like a blank slate. So you start with a vision. What can be if money was not a factor and any idea was welcome, have a vision for what this place can be. And then you start to figure it out. Next, please. And if you don't know what a city can be, you can always ask. You know, People who want to live in a place or already live in a place, just ask the community, what would you want to do here? You know, what, and this, this picture just does that. And um, the community is really the expert on what they want and what they like and what are they going to use on a sustained basis. Next, please. And surveys and forms are very important when you're asking people that. And it's important to not create them in a way that only you understand them. It is important to create them in a way that the community understands. So ask people for things like, what would you like to do on your you like to do in your park? And that should give you a robust data to work with. Next, please. And then it is your job as a problem solver, or my job as a designer, or any one of us on the panel, then it is our job to fill in the details. How do you create a fabric that supports what people just asked you? If people said that they want to sit outside and have coffee on their porch, how do you create the type of environment where they can come out, sit outside on their porch, and have coffee? So that is where our job becomes really, really critical. Next, please. And people are different. You know, there's, they, there's no one mold that everybody is going to fit into. If you just think about, go back and think about your neighborhood, everybody who lives in that neighborhood, everybody who lives in that block is different. So it's important to give some sort of a consideration to differences and diversity in who you're catering to. And it's very visible in this picture. You know, there are people who walk, there are people who carry suitcases, there are people who wear shorts, and there are people who wear tuxes all the time. So it's all those little differences that you have to think about when you're creating a city. Next, please. One thing that does prove very powerful is this is a truth check kind of a thing. If your city works for the person who's eight year old, and then if the city works for the person who's 80 year old, you've basically covered everybody in between. So is it is the environment you're creating, is it comfortable for a child? And is it comfortable for an older adult? Because both of those user groups have very different needs and demands than all the other groups in between. So this is this is where you fact check. If you created a fast moving street where you can only drive and you cannot really walk, maybe the person who can't drive anymore is not going to be on that street. And maybe the person who's not gotten a driving license yet is not going to be on that street. So this is a way where you kind of fact check all the decisions that you're going to make and all the concepts that you come up with. How does it affect the eight year old and the 80 year old? Next please. And women, as I said, the idea of comfort is very different between men and women. And 50% of the world, you know, or more, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> is, is women. So every user group is different from another, and you cannot leave any one of them out. So just like I said, 8 and 80 cities, another place for you to fact check all the things you think about is women. Every decision that you're taking or every concept that you're coming up with, is it comfortable for women? Next, please. And you have to create uses and activities. Like, why go to a place? Why go to a park? Why go to a street? There has to be a reason for you to stay. So things like, is there a game for me to play? Or is there a place for me to sit? If I feel like I need to paint a sidewalk, can I go paint a sidewalk? So all these little uses and activities become the glue of a public space. And it's important to think about them in every user group, which you're going to consider. You know, I gave you a whole different list of users that you need to consider. Sorry for making things complicated, but all of those users each attract, get attracted to different types of uses and activities. Next, please. And if there aren't any uses and activities, if there isn't a park, if there's nothing that exists right now, there's always room to create something. So it is the public realm, after all. You can always think about activating it. It's you know There's a lot of stuff that comes up on Google if you look up public space act activation strategies. What it really means is that if you have a wide street and you're trying to create a park, chances are there is a way to do that. And there is someone in the world who's already done that. So if nothing is going on in a place already, there's always room to create something. 
and that goes back to the definition of the public realm. It's public space. It is created by the tax dollars. It is created for the public. It's created for the common good. So you can always try to activate it. Next, please. And then seasons are important too. Each one of you on the call right now, you're, you're from different areas and different seasons. And the fact is, a city doesn't shut down at any time of the year. So a public space doesn't shut down at any time of the year. So if you're, if you're thinking about a strategy for activation, please do consider the different seasons and different types of um, uses that that can be attracted to that season. Next, please. And again, can't emphasize enough. Think big and start small. No, no action is small, too small to have an impact. Next, please. And public space activation strategies and public space change is all about giving the city back to the people. Next, please. And there's always, there's don't be afraid of failing. Unless you do something as big as a multi-layer, multi-mile highway, nothing else, no other decision is too big. So don't be afraid of testing new things and new ideas and being innovative. Next, please. And here's a summary of everything I just said. You know, Lessons are out there, observe and learn. Always ask the community. Learn the skills to translate people's ideas into concepts. Find partners and stakeholders. It literally takes a village. Think mac macro, but always start small. Document and learn. Keep an eye out at the vision. And here's my information. You can always reach me. That was my last slide, guys. All right. Uh, thank you, Nitty, for your outstanding perspective on the planning of public spaces. That was great to hear. As a reminder, audience, you're welcome to ask today's panel of experts using the chat section. Really encourage you to take advantage of that. All right, on to our next panelist, Sam Goder, an engineer and senior associate of transportation at Project for Public Spaces. After spending several years working on civil and transportation engineering projects, Sam's mission shifted to finding ways to create places that encourage, you're going to love this, youth to use bicycles. You see, Sam grew up riding bikes for fun and he took a great interest in how street designs affected his experience as a writer. With this planning mindset, he went on to earn a Bachelor's of Engineering at uh, Southampton University in the United Kingdom, later moving to the U.S., and as a professional, he again observed how street designs around him reduced accessibility for biking and walking. Determined to put his engineering background to use, he sought to redesign streets to improve public access for cyclists. Sam has worked on safe routes to school initiatives, shared space and bike infrastructure projects, and even built a few pump tracks. Today, as part of Project for Public Spaces transportation team, he currently helps decision makers understand that streets are places too. And yes, every day Sam bikes to work. Sam, as a, as a cyclist myself, uh, thank you for your work, and I hand it over to you. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Future Cities, for, for having us and getting us involved. Thanks, all of you, for tuning in. Uh, this, is a, this is an honor for me to um, get my thinking into the minds of our future leaders. So congratulations for entering the competition, and best of luck. I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to skim through them. I'm going to give you a lot of things to think about. I'm not going to tell you how to do anything, but um, I really just want you to think of your streets in your city as public spaces first and, and, and foremost and what they are going to look like um, from eye, eye level for people actually on the ground exp experiencing your, your cities. All right, let's go. <clears throat> so communities today, very isolated. We have zoning rules, which means um, we have segregated land uses, so offices are one place, homes are one place, places to hang out are another place, and as a result we, we've spread out over a lot of land and we have to do a lot of driving to um, do our daily errands, which hasn't really worked out too well. Next slide. It started off okay, all the kids in the cul-de-sacs like, knew everyone else on their street and rode around, which was fun for a while, but then when we built so much, Next slide. <laughs> we end up with stuff like this, and you have to drive miles to go and see your neighbors, and you have to drive miles to get to the store, and this is what uh, some of our communities look like from, from space. And um, that's not really the way that cities want to go anymore. They, they, they want to mix their land uses and become more walkable and dense, 
um, have more interesting things going on on the street and um, create environments where people can really get to know each other and socialize. Next slide. And this is what we end up with. I'm sure you've all been stuck in traffic like this, and it's just miserable. And it really comes down to the way that we use the land that we ha we have developed. So when when you're thinking about your city, think about how we can uh, mi minimize the need to uh, travel long distances. Next slide. So at PPS, we talk about um, public space really bringing all those things together. So if you want to go from school to city hall or to the library you're getting there on a, a public space, which is what you do now, but we just think of our streets um, as spaces for cars, not spaces for, for other things. So next slide. So we think of streets like that too. Okay, so PPS, I'm gonna let you like go over these slides later on, but we have um, this idea that a place promotes health, it's good for social interaction, and in transportation, we think that that should apply to streets too. Next slide. So, you know, a lot of cities kind of happened organically over time, very incrementally, and people didn't need to travel long distance. And um, a photo from so a painting, I believe, from Scotland. Um, a long time ago, before before we started designing our cities for cars, and you could get everything you need um, for, for for your day by walking, biking, taking a horse. Like no one was traveling huge, huge distances when we started laying these cities out, and they were very livable places. Um, there was a little bit of issue with horse waste, <laughs> which the cars solved, but um, all, all all in all, very um, accessible, dense, mixed uh, use. For, for land development. Next slide, please. Um, I like to talk a little bit about street networks. Um, you can see on the left the traditional grid. That's what we're kind of we've figured out works best for cities. There's if 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 there's uh, an accident or construction on a roadway, there's a lot of um, other ways to, to to get places. A lot of options. Whereas on the right, if you have cul-de-sacs leading to arterials, leading to bigger roads, then it's very hard to get around. And if there's an accident on the arterial, then no one can get anywhere. So start thinking about how you're going to move around your cities. Next slide. Uh, this is Barcelona. They just, uh, there's a link to this at the end of my presentation, but they are implementing something called super blocks. So they are restricting traffic in uh, like these three by three blocks, so nine blocks all together restricting traffic and really focusing on reprogramming these streets to be great public spaces where people can walk, bike, skateboard, blade, whatever they want um, without, you know, just having to be in constant fear of cars. Next slide, please. So this kind of shows how the network will work at the superblocks. But there's a link to the article at the back of my presentation. You should, you should check it out. Next slide. So what I really want you to think is what are streets for? Are they only for moving vehicles? Are they only for transportation? Um, next slide. Or are they places where you know other things can happen? You know, this is a very typical street in America. Very wide, very fast, very narrow sidewalk. You know, you couldn't imagine grandma walking across the street to go and get a loaf of bread in, on, the, on, on this kind of typical street. Next slide. Um, and we've ended up with these tiny little pedestrian zones where, where people are forced onto narrow sidewalks or, or, or crossings and they're not really allowed to use the, the public space because we've devoted it all to, to trying to move as many cars through our cities as fast as possible, which I'm suggesting might not be the best way to plan our streets. Next slide. Um, do you, what do you want from your streets? Do you want them to be places where kids can roam around freely and discover things? Like, look at this little uh, community library. People just leave their books in here. So this is a kid's one, so it's a kid's eye level. has a lot of kids' books, and the kid is just free to take a book, and then so maybe his mom will leave a book another day. Like, this, this, we love this kind of stuff at PPS. Next slide. Um, are, are streets where kids can play and develop friendships and experiment and maybe like get a grazed knee and have a little adventure? Are they places where mom and dads are constantly worried that their kids are going to run into traffic and, you know, 
is that really what, what you want your kids' childhoods to be? I want, I want you to design your cities for your children, even though you guys are pretty young right now. Next slide. Um, Nitty showed this slide as well, but it's kind of true. Like we've dev we've devoted so much of our space for for vehicles, and yes, we are trying to do a better job with transit. But I don't know if you'll find a more futuristic, better way of getting people around than the humble bicycle. Next slide. <laughs> I love this. This is Steve Jobs' favorite slide. He's the Apple guy. He the, he thought of uh, he well. Let me tell you what this means. This means that mice and lemmings use a lot of energy to go anywhere, and salmon use hardly any energy. The cost of transportation in calories per gram per kilometer. So if you're a salmon, you are the most efficient animal at getting around. Until what's this under here? A man on a bicycle is what ten times more efficient than a salmon. So Next slide. <laughs> next slide. Okay, there's an even Illich quote there, but we can go to the, the next slide. Good luck trying to find something that's going to get you around your cities as, as efficiently as a bike uh, that's quiet, that makes people healthy, that encourages social interaction, it doesn't take a lot of room to store when you get there, that doesn't pollute. I'm, I'm interested to hear what you guys come up with. Maybe you have uh, self driving flying cars and You'll, you'll figure something out, but as far as I'm concerned, bike's your best bet. You know, I, w I want to live in a city where this is just, you, do, you don't even bet an eyelid, this is just normal behavior, a mom taking her kid to school. Next slide. Um, how much of your, your city streets are you going to give to pedestrians away from vehicles? I just, I just love this photo. This is, I think, the Brooklyn or Manhattan Bridge in New York when it first opened. Fantastic. Uh, pedestrian facility. Next slide. Uh, this is in Brooklyn. Um, you know, this is down the middle of a really busy street, but it's a really nice promenade. Um, I love this kind of thing. Like, there's, there's shade, there's tree cover. It's a really great public space, and it functions as part of the transportation network, too. Next slide. Um, if you're not giving your city to parking spaces like they did in Hartford. Can, this is the parking 1957 compared to 2009. You know, half the surface of the city is parking lots, and no one goes to a city because there's lots of parking. Think of reasons why people would want to go to your city and try and do, do something more interesting than build parking lots, please. Next slide. Um, when you don't design for parking, I mean, this is just down the road from me in, in, Man in uh, Brooklyn, they just got rid of those parking spaces, and now there's like a really cool public space with seats, shade, food trucks. People just go there, hang out on their lunch break. There's people playing music. It's such a more human scale use for that for that little spot of land, and it really does wonders for that that, that neighborhood. Next slide. So. I guess the main takeaway is what do you want your streets to be for? What kind of activities do you want to happen in them? How are you going to make that happen? Are you just going to zone them differently? Are you, are you going to restrict vehicle use? I'm really interested to see what you, you guys come up with. Next slide. Um, we, we talk a lot of PPS about markets. You know, where does your food come from? Is, are you, are you going to have self-sustaining blocks where you grow your own food, where you produce your own electricity? Um, Next slide. I'll fly through these. Uh, is there something to do for everyone? You know, I, I said design your city for kids, but you know, is it safe for grandma to be w walking around? Is it safe for dog owners? Is it somewhere where people want to just be and hang out for every age group, for, no matter what kind of things you're into? Um, a good good public space makes everyone feel feel feel, feel comfortable. Next slide. Um, you can do so much with street space interesting, colorful, you can have your own identity and image. Um, you know, this, this paint job here in Montreal, I was in Montreal a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't have to stay like that forever. Maybe the community comes and paints it a different color next year, but it creates like a memorable street and just breaks up the monotony of um, black asphalt. Next slide. Um, we're trying to work with communities now to kind of uh, do this thing. They, this started in Portland, it's called Intersection Repair. 
and uh, the community gets together and decides to paint an intersection. Brilliant. Everyone knows everyone. They have, they have lemonade stalls. They bring food out. It's really great to build a community. You know, you can't say enough about these, these kind of projects. They're, they're really amazing. Next slide. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk for one second about shared space. This is uh, a project in England where they just kept adding signs and traffic lights, and it wasn't working. There was traffic, and next slide, and people couldn't cross the street. I'm enough waiting here, Frank. No one is enjoying crossing that street. That is a not nice place to be because it's been totally designed to move vehicles. So they took all the traffic lights out. Next slide, and they just reinvented the intersection. Okay, this is like a cartoon of what it was kind of like. Next slide. They, re they reinvented the intersection. They, they got rid of all the traffic signs, and people thought it was going to be a huge disaster, and there was going to be massive traffic lines. And guess what? Next slide. There wasn't. We, you know, we just tried to <laughs> add so many signs. And we treat people like idiots, but humans are very intelligent animals, and they generally don't smash into each other when there's a little bit of... Um, uh, confusion, people slow down. Next slide. Okay, so this is the video, so you've got to click on the screen. Mate. So this is, people in England don't actually drive this fast. This is, this is speeded up, but the traffic flows much better and the delays are much less than when there was all the traffic lights and all the signs and it was a horrible place to be. So there's a link to the video uh, at, at the back of my presentation about this whole project. It's like a 15 minute video, but it's well worth watching. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like today. You know, people cross the street wherever they want. People drive five, six miles an hour. They yield to pedestrians. They yield to cyclists. There's very few accidents, no serious accidents. Next slide. And this shared space concept is kind of taking off, and I really like it. And this is Exhibition Road in London, where there's a lot of very important museums. Next slide. And that was a few years ago. And this is what it looks like today. We took out all the traffic control. We put out some seats. We made it much pleasant, more pleasant experience for the person, you know, at the human scale. And traffic can still go through. There's, there's, there's no major traffic delays, but... Drivers are smarter than you think. You don't need to be controlling them all the time. They adapt to their environment. Next slide. Um, simple things you can do to make a place interesting. I, I love these planters. You know, you can use you can use uh, landscaping and plants in so many ways to pr protect bike lanes from traffic, or just to beautify a street, or offer some shade or some color. Um, next slide. Uh, this is Walter Kula. She's amazing. So this road is pretty boring, I think. So s next slide. See what he thought it could maybe look like. Just a, just a little tweak. The car lanes don't need to be so narrow. You can um, make it easier for pedestrians to cross the street. Yes, cars still need to get through, and they can, but it doesn't have to be the sole purpose of the design of the street. Okay, next slide. And, and next slide. Uh, this is a great public space. This was just a very wide road a few years ago, I think, in Seattle, and they kind of closed it to traffic. And now this place, every lunchtime, is just buzzing. There's, there's food trucks, there's games, there's giant Jenga, foosball, really great example of, of a public space. I was just in Seattle last week, and I thought you would enjoy this photo. Next slide. Um, the other thing you guys should check out is URB-I, which has taken Google Street Images uh, of fantastic street transformation. So this is Budapest and Hungary, 2011. They had like a cut highway through this neighborhood. They filled it in, and look, they put some outdoor dining and made it a, and thought they helped me make this a great place. And now it is. So you can skim through these ones pretty fast, Maggie, but I, I just wanted to show you some examples of the kind of stuff that they have and where um, street space and public space is really going, like all, all, all over the world. We're having nice textures on our streets. It's not so boring. We've got nice pavers. There's a foosball in that photo. Um, you know, just more space for people. So your, your task is to save the world, right? So you need to <laughs> improve air quality and water quality, and our current transport isn't doing our air or water quality any any favors. So I'm really interested to see how you guys are going to treat the stormwater runoff and help the air quality in your in your cities that you uh, that you come up with. All right, I'm out of time. Next slide. This is, 
and you're going to save the world from diabetes because you're going to have people being active. Next slide. <laughs> this is a bunch of words that you can Google if you want to know what the experts are talking about. And I think that's me. Yeah, here's the, here's the uh, links to the resources I, I mentioned. Give them a click. And I will see you all soon, hopefully. Good luck with your, uh, with your competition, and I'll see you soon. All right. Sam, great insight on functional city designs for the teams to apply. Our next panelist, Dr. Boyd, uh, he, he's going to be answering a few of the questions on brownfields that I saw coming through, uh, so, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Dr. Boyd will share how to creatively convert brownfields to usable public spaces. Dr. Boyd is an engineer and managing partner at LCA Environmental in Dallas, Texas with over 25 years of environmental engineering experience. He's managed hundreds of environmental and brownfield projects for cities, airports, hospitals, and yes, even schools, from project management to leading hazardous waste investigations. He's a nationally certified Envision Sustainable Sustainability Professional by the Institute of Sustainable Infrastructure, a diplomat water resource engineer by the American Academy of Water Resources Engineers as well. Dr. Boyd is the incoming president for the American Society of Civil Engineers Dallas branch where he regularly volunteers, and in his remaining time of his day, a uh, busy day, he serves as an adjunct faculty professor for Southern Methodist University uh, Engineering School in Dallas, Texas, and where he teaches environmental engineering courses to graduate students. As a recipient of the Dallas Engineer of the Year Award by both the Texas Section of uh, the Texas Society of Professional Engineers and the American Society of Civil Engineer Engineers Dallas branch, we welcome Dr. Boyd. Uh, our third panelist to share about brownfields. <clears throat> Thanks, Martin. Uh, I wanted to echo what, what Sam said. Uh, you know, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for Future City to have, him, to have me here to speak to you. This has been a really lot of fun listening to Nitty and Sam. I, I hadn't heard their presentations, um, and so I made a few notes here, so if you forgive my ad-libbing, I, I uh, I have a, a few things that I'm going to talk about that dovetail into what uh, what they talked about. And Martin introduced uh, my talk as the how-to. Well, I've got to tell you that uh, I want to tell you that the you know look to Sam's and Nitty's uh, presentations for the how-to, because how to redevelop brownfields to uh, public spaces is once you get to the idea that you are going to develop at a particular location that's a brownfield. Then from there, the how-to becomes the setting and the population and who, who lives there and what do they do and what do they like and what makes them happy and what makes them comfortable. So my first slide here has an equation, and this equation is not a thing. I came, I came up with it uh, for this presentation, so you don't, don't put it on your, uh, on your entry. Um, it's not a quantifiable presentation, but it shows you that I'm an engineer and I like equations. So why am I saying that public space, that the power of public space is, is boosted uh, to the exponent of redeveloping brownfield? What sort of this is about? You know, where you put the public space, if it's made from whole cloth, if it wasn't there before, is essential to a lot of the things that Nitty and Sam were talking about in terms of accessibility and comfort and making people happy. Next slide, please. All right, so let's start with what is a ground, brown, uh, green field. What is a green field? Obviously the opposite of a brown field. And this a gentleman looking out across a green field to a city off in the horizon, uh, he could be thinking about two things. One, he could be thinking, I hope he does not thinking this way, is to create a city that doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't exist yet. I hope that's not his vision. That shouldn't be ours. Uh, we need to be creating cities uh, that are better for the people that are already in cities and not creating any new cities. The second thing he could be thinking about is he's standing out in the field or in a green field or in an open space somewhere that's unpopulated, and there's nobody around and said, oh, I think I could, I could build, I could, I could create a really cool, you know, uh, public space out here, you know, far away from the city. Uh, just because the land is cheap, just because I don't have any other challenges to deal with, like uh, the ground might, might be contaminated, or uh, there may be some social reasons that I wouldn't want to put it there. You know, uh, we're just going to sit here far away, stand here far away from the city and build. 
Well, that's sort of the thing we don't want to do. But that's what the green field doesn't have to be a green field per se, but just someplace that uh, humans haven't had a great deal of effect on yet. Next slide, please. All right, so what is a brownfield? It's an underused space. Let's call it a wasted space uh, where it's uh, near where people live, but it's also a place uh, that is complicated. It's complicated because uh, I guess humans uh, like, uh, not like Sam and Nitty who have imagination, but other engineers, perhaps and planners with little imagination might turn away from these areas be just because there's a few challenges. You know, things like the presence of poten or potential presence of hazardous substances, pollutants, and contaminants. And the reason that I say uh, potential is because quite often uh, it's the perception of these places. Uh, on the on the uh, left hand uh, photo here on the screen, uh, it's a typical could be anywhere in the United States where you have a population center and then not far away, not far away, an area that used to be industrialized. Perhaps it's abandoned. Perhaps it's been contaminated. Uh, that's a target place for a brownfield for a, an open public space to be uh, developed. Uh, to the right is one of my own sites in Fort Worth, much smaller in scale. Uh, but also with uh, uh, mercury, lead contamination, but um, hydrocarbon solvents, but also something that we as environmental engineers are prepared to deal with and can deal with as long as planners have enough imagination to consider it. Next slide, please. Thank you. So where are your opportunities for brownfield development of public spaces? Well, my goodness, they're everywhere in the United States. These are the same two photos I had before. To the left is what the EPA's sort of a, a red dot map of where our brownfields are. Yeah, they're mostly in cities, uh, and they're mostly near people. Um, and there are areas that people don't like to walk through, walk around, be near, because uh, they've been either tainted in a real sense by real contamination or simply that they've been abandoned by industries and commercial areas because the uh, because of uh, general decline in the neighborhood, that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, next, uh, next. Uh, okay, so with, okay, yeah, next slide. Good. So I was going to make the point at the end of that last slide was that the, really the sky is the limit with that many brownfield site opportunities. The sky is the limit for. Uh, an urban planner to uh, to identify where some of these wasted spaces are and redevelop them into, into beautiful, comfortable uh, gathering places for people. Now, why are we there? Why? And and you know, forgive me for this uh, for this jump in 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 I guess uh, in in the presentation. I'm showing you some fictional stuff here on this slide. Uh, why are we talking about redeveloping brownfields to public spaces or open spaces? Why are we talking about public spaces at all? Well, I'd like to think that people like uh, visionary people like Nitty and Sam are partly uh, uh, exist because visionaries like Dr. Isaac Asimov. Now, I was warned by a colleague here that most of you would never know who that was, and that's kind of a shame. He was uh, he was a uh, one of the best science fiction writers of the early science fiction age, but he was also a scientist and a visionary in his own right. In his series, uh, uh, Foundation and Empire, he described a city, a planet city, fully encased with a steel roof, uh, 42,000 years in, this, in the future, with the population of 45 billion, uh, about the size of planet Earth. Uh, artificial sky lighting, and with some attempts, attempts at public spaces. Uh, all, of course, all the native ecosystems destroyed, most of the national re natural resources depleted. Uh, a poor quality of life, you know, people made do, um, but, uh, and there were some artificial open or public spaces, but not really someplace, not really a vision of the future I think anybody, any of us would like to uh, have come to reality and yet, this is what would happen to us, a full encapsulation into our technology, if people like Sam and Nitty were not pushing forward the visions that they are to change the way we do things with public spaces. So my point is here, we do not want to become Trantor, so 
your entry into this con uh, into this competition not only is is uh, it's it's not just a theoretical exercise. This is actually where we slide, please. All right. So back down to earth. I have two examples of what I'm talking about that are real examples that I want to mention very briefly. And again, my presentation is not intended to give you the how-to. Look, look to Sam and Nitty for that. But it's, it's intended to show you the kind of imagination that's being used now by planners to take uh, wasted spaces and enhance the quality of life uh, and uh, the comfort and the gathering potential of a place. So in the Trinity River vision, uh, it comes from uh, the Trinity River Basin uh, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There's a place called, what we now call Panther Island or Central City, uh, which, is, uh, which is what is planned to be an urban waterfront community. It's 800 acres. What's ongoing now is an environmental cleanup, flood control plans, infrastructure improvements, a 33-acre town lake and a boardwalk, a higher learning education or a Tarrant County College campus on the river. If you want, if you want to know more about it, I have a link up here. Uh, there can be boating and water activities. Uh, next slide. But this is very much a work in progress. Right now, what we have to the north is uh, an area that's this. If you're familiar with Fort Worth. Uh, it's the stockyards area, the historic stockyards area, it's the historic uh, uh, or arts district, I meant to say. Um, and then to the south of this area is uh, downtown Fort Worth. And really between those two, it's kind of a sad drive between those two spots. It's, it's kind of an abandoned area that Fort Worth used to be, um, you know, the center of, uh, of, uh, of, of the cattle industry because of the cattle drives and the way the railroad came in and had uh, uh, the, the, the stories told that uh, the, the, the Trinity River in this area and downstream of this area at the turn of the century, and I'm talking about the turn of the, of the, from the 1800s into the early 1900s, was running red like the mythical river Styx in Hades because of the, um, because of the blood from the cattle butchering. And today, it's much better than that, but what was left behind with the residual, with the residual industries and the uh, and the activities in this large area were a lot of uh, abandoned industrial sites, just very similar to the picture that I showed you early on. And so what we have is a sort of a sort of a hole in the donut of this part of Fort Worth where visionaries are wanting to turn this whole area into something that's truly truly, uh, if it ever comes completely into fruition, will be magnificent. Uh, next, uh, next page, please. So what they're looking at is creating this 33-acre lake. They're looking at restoring aquatic ecosystems. Um, they're looking at a boardwalk and a 33-acre lake and having flood control. And of course, businesses and, and uh, higher learning centers and and uh, places, open places, tons of opportunities for open places for people to congregate, be happy, and have a sense of community. Uh, again, this is in uh, progress. This is a work in progress. What's happened so far is we're in the middle of some cleanup, which I have a small part of, uh, and uh, the planning is ongoing by all kinds of professionals and organizations and uh, public and private. Next, uh, next uh, slide. There you go. The second example I wanted to briefly mention was in Dallas. This project was built and completed on basically what was predominantly an old city dump. The city dump had hazardous, uh, hazardous materials component to it. The total amount of development was 140 acres. 27 of, of those acres were playing fields. What I want to emphasize here is that the, is the location. Where would we in the city of Dallas that's so well developed for the community that's served, that needs a high class athletic complex, uh, well, well, uh, well presented nature preserve, where would it be if it weren't in this sort of thing, a brownfield? 
uh, it would be far, far away, north of the suburbs, where really the people that needed this kind of thing uh, couldn't get to. Oh, well, that's why I bring it up as an example. Uh, the, the things that engineers had to deal with was to make sure that, and because we go through s drought and flood cycles in this city, uh, that uh, that uh, they would assure that the irrigation needed for the fields would be from non-potable potable water sources. Uh, they had to capture and filter stormwater runoff because that's always a possibility of being contaminated by the by the dump uh, or the trash and the solid waste that's encapsulated below. Uh, leachate control. Uh, uh, they had to take some areas and rebury the trash because it was exposed. And this area not only brings six million dollars a year of economic impact to the area due to you know, soccer tournaments and things like that, but it obviously brings a high quality or an enhanced quality of life, a uh, sense of community, a gathering place, a place where people can be happy and compete and, and enjoy the uh, public space that is there. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So. Really? I didn't give you a lot of detail, did I? But I can tell you that your, uh, your anybody's plan, whether it's for the contest or whether it's for the competition or whether it's in real life, is uh, greatly enhanced if you can find areas that are wasted, that have been abandoned, that, that, have been, um, that uh, planners have given up on, and you have a vision for those areas and you can think big and think far in the future and use uh, engineers like me and, and uh, planners like uh, and engineers like Sam and planners like Nitty to help you uh, or help the public to develop those areas. So for your, for your contest, um, for your competition, I mean think big, think far in the future, maybe not 40,000 years, build, help, build healthy public spaces and plan something that you personally would love to live near, love to participate, love to hang out in, and love to enjoy. Next slide, please. Well, that, that does it. Um, uh, I had told Martin to sort of, he had asked me, you know, the reason this slide is up here, whether there's something I'd like to mention about what I've done maybe in my childhood. Actually, this is a picture of my son about nine years ago when he was shorter than I was. We were at Machu Picchu. This is about the fifth time I'd visited Machu Picchu, so I'd been to Machu Picchu as a child. Um, but I took the Boy Scouts up there on the Inca Trail. We went on the 26-mile hike over two 13,000-foot uh, uh, mountain passes, and I was in a lot better shape back then. And I'll leave you with, because there's no doubt with everything that I've experienced with, uh, with uh, the Inca uh, culture and the Quechua, that uh, that they followed these rules because they uh, they created such wonderful public spaces for themselves and such sustainable um, sustainable empire, albeit for a brief period of time. And they didn't go down; they didn't fail because of their lack of sustainability in their uh, in their planning. But their golden rule was amasua, amayuya, amakeya, which is basically don't be a thief or don't steal. Uh, don't lie and don't be lazy. And I can tell you that there weren't any lazy Incas, more than likely. And if we uh, if we are lazy, then what we'll continue to do is build cities like uh, is move towards the the horrifying vision of Trantor and uh, and and away from uh, and away from Sands and Nitty's vision because it takes effort and it takes a vision to talk about the kinds of changes in transportation and access to public spaces that Nitty and Sam were talking about. So um, that, I believe, is my last slide. No, it's not. Yes, it is. So thank you very much, and that's my presentation. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Maggie, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you uh, to field any questions here. Terrific. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have uh, some questions from the audience. And I realize we've gone a little bit over our time. So um, if you have to leave, certainly do. You can come back and check out the recording um, afterwards. That will be up on our website tomorrow. But um, panelists, I've unmuted you guys. Um, so let's get to some questions. Um, so here's one from Madison. She wants 
um, some suggestions on how to make a public space effective for all ages. I think a few of you kind of touched on that, but any any specific ideas that you can give Madison? Uh, I'll jump in first, um, if that's okay with you, Sam. Perfect. Um, yeah, so in terms of making a public space effective for all ages, think about what are the types of things that they would want to do outside of their house. Like for a child, maybe they want to learn how to ride a bike, or maybe they want to learn um, how to play a particular game outside. So how can you sort of improve these things into a design? As far as learning to ride a bike goes, maybe you can have wider, wider sidewalks. Or maybe you can have very slow moving streets where everybody proceeds with caution. So you match the type of thing they want to do with the kind of decision that they make. And the same would apply for what does your grandma want to do outside? Maybe she wants to sit outside and have a cup of coffee with her girlfriend. So how do you do that? Is there a comfortable place for her to sit right outside your house where she can also sit with her girlfriend in shade and enjoy that cup of coffee? So try to match the kinds of things that they would want to do with the way, you know, with the things that can cater to that. I hope that answered your question. Great. Yeah, thanks, Nitty. Um, terrific. Here's another question for kind of all of you panelists. Um, if you, given all of your knowledge and expertise, which um, maybe top, <laughs> Dina is asking for top three best planned cities and top three worst planned cities. Um, so maybe maybe not three of each, but if you can maybe think of one that might be great to use kind of as an example that our teams could research, um, both kind of greatly laid out and maybe with some innovative uses of public space, and then one that maybe has some has some work to do. Wow, that is a loaded, loaded question. And yeah. <laughs> a question that every urbanist sort of hates to answer, I must say. I will give you one of these. And um, I would say look into Copenhagen. And the reason I say Copenhagen is because it was a city that looked pretty much like any other American city up until, I want to say, like 25 years ago. So they were having problems such as cars clogging up the street, way too many people on the streets, and all those things, which is when there was a conscious decision to get climate smart, and there was a conscious decision to be more inclusive of other modes of getting around. So Copenhagen very rapidly built infrastructure to promote the use of bicycles. And today is a day where, uh, if on a street, there is a counter for bicycles. And after rush hour, that counter reads 1 million. So all of this happened in the lifetime of people who are, who are still living and who saw this change happen. So there is no idea that is too big for implementation over the course of a decade or two decades. So definitely look into Cape of Copenhagen. I can't say I hate this city, but there's a lot of cautionary tales about Houston, Texas. And given that I went to school in Texas, I have a lot of love and hate for Houston. But I, I, Houston is at a point where it is almost impossible to be without a car, to be anywhere um, you know, in the city. It is too big. It is too car-centric. And there is not, there are basically no rules around, that, around that land use and planning. So it is too much flexibility for to be good for a city. There were no constraints. And they are now fighting back. There are a lot of groups like Houston Tomorrow and whatnot. They are trying to fight back and create a more human-friendly, human-use city. But they did make some pretty massive mistakes uh, to begin with. And like I said, don't hold it against me. I do love and hate Texas. But it is, I, I'm a non-driver, and I had a really difficult time getting around Houston without a car. And I think. To be free as a person living in a city, you need to consider all the different kinds of users. So that's where I'd leave you. Awesome. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, Maggie, can I jump in on that? Because that's kind of a fascinating question. Sure uh, thing. I hate to uh, I, ha I hate to call it, you know, the worst city, planned city, because really when a city gets bad, it, it really means it wasn't planned at all. And um, uh, you know, Lima, I, I grew up in, in seven different countries around the world. I ended up going to 14 different schools by the time I graduated high school. And the, the, it, the, the city that comes to mind that I visited and didn't live in, but that I visited recently because I have family, is Lima, Peru. Lima is 
was identified by the World Health, Health Organization as having the worst air quality in Latin America, which is not a good thing to, to have happen to you as a city. But not only that, there's a, it, there's a population of 8 million there, and it literally takes, um, there's no, I mean, I understand what everybody's feeling is about arteries and roadways, but there's virtually is no good artery, artery to get from one side of Lima to another. And it's a little like Houston, what Nita said about Houston is that there's no restrictions on land use. So absolutely, I'd say that if somebody wanted to research Lima, you almost have to, you almost have to visit there to know what I'm talking about, but it is not a well-planned city at all. Cool. Great. Thanks for that input. Any other panelists want to jump in and <laughs> drudge some cities? Terrific. Um, and I actually think Sam had to jump off, but we have a question that um, maybe Nitty you can speak to. Um, just kind of what are some, Maxwell wants to know, what are some key um, aspects that would make a mass transit system great? And I know we've talked a lot about different modes of transportation and kind of how do they all yes. come together. I can definitely answer that question. Um, there are some things that make mass transit very successful is they should definitely be touching upon destinations in a city. So if you're working on an already existing city, you already know what are the places people like to go to. If there's a very famous stadium or a famous opera house or a famous park and things like that, where are those destinations that people are going to? then you also have to consider where are these trips originating. So where do you live? If you want to go to the Opera House, where do you live and where are you trying to get? And how do you create a simple route that takes you there? So that's very important. And the second thing is that is important is how do you make rapid transit efficient? Because a lot of times what ends up taking buses the longest to pull in and pull out of a, of a bus stop is how quickly can everybody get on it? So how do you think of smart ways to maybe everybody buys a ticket on the app or maybe everybody's already ticketed in before the bus arrives and things like that. How do you make that lag the shortest possible? How do you make it quick for you to board and deboard the bus? Maybe that means five doors and not one. All these things. I know you guys are a lot more creative than I am at this stage, but think about where are you starting, where are you going, and how do you make that process fast? I had a quick question for uh, Nitty and Mark. If you can share an example of your favorite public space, not city, but public space. Just really wanted to hear what those were for you. Well, I'll go first because I have an answer for that. And I have two because I really struggle between those two. Um, New York City, my two favorite public spaces would have to be Washington Square Park and Bryant Park for very different reasons. Bryant Park is controlled and programmed all the time. There's something going on there all the time because the conservancy makes sure, makes sure that there is. Washington Square Park is always bustling with activity because if you wanted to go and do something there, there's nobody who's stopping you. And it is surrounded by students from New York University. So people just come in, you know, all people who practice ballet dance in the park and people who want to just practice their jazz session and somebody who just wants to skate around. You just flow in, and there's nobody coming in and saying, stop, don't do that, unless it's an illegal activity. If you're bringing positive views, you're welcome. So there are two great public spaces, but very differently managed. Great. Well, Martin, mine would be uh, the National Mall. And I don't know what planners like Nitty would think about the National Mall, but it's <laughs> for me, I don't know how well it's, uh, it's laid out. Uh, in terms of the public space, but it, it's certainly a place where I was happy as a child to visit and learn about the history of the United States and and uh, and all the uh, you know all the all the monuments that are there and uh, and dedications to our uh, to our country's leadership and the way that all those are laid out from you know Martin Luther King Memorial to uh, you know. Thomas Jefferson uh, to the uh, to the Washington Memorial. I guess that would of, of all the public spaces, that's my favorite. I mean, I, I I've, I've been to a lot of them all over the world, uh, but that's the one that comes to mind. Terrific. It's definitely Thanks. very rich and lively. 
Terrific. Um, we have a question from Sal who was wondering if a dump would be considered a brownfield. What do you think about that, Mark? Well, my yes. My example of the Elm Fork uh, soccer complex, uh, that 140 acres of nature preserve, athletic complex, soccer complex, was built on a city dump. And maybe I glossed through that slide uh, too quickly to make that point. Um, and the, the, it's interesting because a, the, an, a public space is probably the best option for siting at a, at, a, at a city dump because what you want to do when you're over a city dump is avoid, avoid what we engineers call enclosed spaces. What happens to enclosed spaces is uh, gases collect inside them and then the enclosed spaces blow up. And that could be everything from a uh, from a public bathroom to a uh, say a maintenance uh, facility or something like that. So you have to be very careful what you build on a dump site because even if you made sure to engineer away the exposure to toxics and uh, the health risks there might be for people that would be on the former on the dump site, and you still have to worry about uh, methane, which is not toxic. Per se, uh, from uh, collecting in in, uh, in in closed spaces, and it's it's definitely something that you have to address. I, I can tell you that the uh, Elm Fork has very few, if any, what would be called enclosed spaces. And if you do build something, uh, then you just have to make sure that uh, you know that there's plenty of ventilation and ways that uh, to prevent explosive gases from getting on the inside. But yes, definitely, it's considered a brownfield. Terrific, thank you. Um, and another question, I think, for you, Mark. Susanna was wondering, what are some ways that um, pollution can be removed from a brownfield to make it a healthy environment and kind of make it into a public space? I'm sure there are lots of ways, so maybe just one or two. That's a fantastic question because of the way that it was posed, because that is, in fact, what most people think of is removal. Uh, we we have more uh, than just removal in our in our bag of, of tools when it comes to redeveloping brownfield. Quite often, yes, we do have to remove the worst of the contamination. Um, the reason we don't always uh, remove everything is cost, because if we were forced to remove every bit of contamination at every every single brownfield site across the nation then essentially what would happen is there would be no brownfield redevelopment because there's not enough money in the world to remove all the contamination. So what we do is remove the worst of it that we know uh, is, an is an imminent threat to anybody occupying the property. Then we apply uh, scientific and engineering concepts and controls to make sure that what we do is going to be uh, is going to render the site safe for occupancy. So a good example is the so are the soccer fields and and the the complex on a city dump. We are able to redirect any kind of uh, fluids or liquids that might be coming out of the landfill and make sure that people aren't going to be exposed to it. And we're able to cap or cover in, or in, or encapsulate the ter in, uh, the uh, the dangerous parts of the material underground so that there's never any possibility that anybody on the surface would get exposed. Um, there are a lot of other, like you said, Maggie, there's a lot of other ways we do things. We can also clean things up uh, with uh, bacterial agents and with uh, chemicals that break down the contaminants to things that aren't, aren't bad for us. Uh, there's all kinds of, of, of ways that environmental engineers have at their disposal, and those and those are only there, the only reason I exist as an environmental engineer and I'm just not a regular old wastewater guy cleaning up uh, people's sewers and sewage systems is that, uh, that uh, the push toward you know, a better quality of life for all of us and a push towards, well, you know, if we, we polluted it, we need to clean it up and make it a good place again. That's what environmental engineers do. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. It sounds like there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of ideas there and a lot of solutions available. So Susanna, definitely maybe uh, research that topic some more with your uh, teammates. Um, I think we have time for one last question, um, and it's an interesting question. Um, how does the location of a city affect, affect its success and ability to thrive? And I would add, kind of thinking about cities in any location, is it really the location that kind of makes or breaks a city, or is it kind of the design of the city? Well, Maybe I'd, like to, I'd like to jump in first. Great. No location is bad. Absolutely none. When you're in, you know, I, I'm in the Northeast now and people usually say, oh, winter is usually dead time. You know, nobody wants to get out. Nobody spends time in public spaces. Wrong. Canadians spend time in public spaces. People in Iceland spend time in public spaces. All those areas and all those countries that have, you know, more extreme climate in the winter, people spend time in outdoor spaces. What do you do? You create uses for outdoor spaces. You think about, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to provide hot chocolates and heating lamps and cross-country skiing and, you know, skating, ice skating? All of those things that people love but are just not existing outside. So none of those things really, you know, or people saying, oh, this area is really flat. How do we do this, that, and the other thing? But there are so many uses that actually do require flat land. You don't need contours to create everything. So no location is bad. And the great thing is we are in the age of World Wide Web. If you want examples, chances are somebody around the world has already figured it out. There's no location that's bad location. I would, I would tell you, do not keep that as a constraint. There's always something that you can do. And that every location has an asset that no other location has. Fantastic. Thanks, Nidhi. And I think that, anything to add, Martin or Mark? Well, yes. Uh, just real quick, I, I can understand perfectly what Nidhi says, but I think that, that there are places that have a limit to the amount of population they can sustain. So I grew up in La Paz, Bolivia, which is, or partly grew up in La Paz, Bolivia, which is a city that almost has no reason to be a city. It's at my high school was at 10,500 feet above sea level, and the international airport there is 11,000. I understand the population is well over a million up there now, and uh, and it's a, a a city of steep slopes, eroding uh, poor soil uh, for foundations and things like that. So uh, the only thing I, I would caution is a setting for a city is that there is a limit to the to the physical. Uh, uh, the reality of a city to sustain a quality of life for a certain amount of people. Uh, Las right. Vegas might be another good example of that. And I would... Uh, no business being out in the desert. Right, and I would actually add to it, uh, Mark, I think you're absolutely right. What I'm trying to say is that every location and every place is good for something and a different kind of city. There's never a silver bullet and one-fits-all solution for any place, and that is really what you have to be thinking about. What are the assets of your particular location, and how do you really enhance those assets? No location is bad for something that you're trying to do. Just figure out what works in your favor and what doesn't. I, 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 I agree completely, and, and I like the idea of researching the most challenging places in the world, you know, like you know, places that have those physical challenges to see what people have done to improve uh, the quality of life in those places. Yep, absolutely. Terrific. Well, I bet some of our teams will do exactly that this year. Um, and I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you um, to Martin, Nitty, Sam, and uh, Mark for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise. It is much appreciated. And thank you to all of you um, for attending. I hope you got some good ideas got some ideas, um, and you can continue to research and uh, brainstorm your solutions, and we can't wait to see what you come up with this year. So thank you all very much for joining us today, and the slides and the recording of this webinar, as a reminder, will be up on Future Cities website um, tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.